All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to call our meeting to order. I apologize, we're starting just a few minutes later than expected today. Um, we were trying to get our streaming capability up and running, but apparently there's a, a YouTube outage or technical glitch this morning. So what we're going to do is uh, record the meeting and it'll be available uh, to be watched afterwards online. Um, and uh, one final note too, if, uh, if everybody could um, make sure we're talking into our microphones and that they're close to us. Uh, when the green light is lit, your microphone is on. When the red light is lit, of course, it's off. If you need to turn it off or on, the, um, you touch the bottom green light and that turns it red. Uh, yeah, there you go. So um, that's kind of how the microphone works. Some folks um, actually commented on the streaming last time, said it was hard to hear us. So we'll all do our best to talk into the microphones. All right, now that the housekeeping is out of the way, let's uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, let's go ahead and call the roll. Commissioner Brian Hammond. Present. John McClain. Present. Ooh, got in just in time for the roll call. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Lappy. Here. Colleen D. Pasquale. Here. Robert Wells. Here. Bill Lapulis. Good morning. Brian Kramer. Good morning. We do have a quorum. Very good. Thank you. All right. The first item on the agenda this morning is approval of the August 13, 2020 TDC minutes. Does somebody wish to make a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make the motion. Okay. The motion is from uh, Mr. Lappy. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second is from Mr. Wachulis. Do we have uh, any discussion on the minutes at all? Okay, seeing none, are there any objections? No objections, that motion carries unanimously. All right, and the first uh, item after the minutes is the public to be heard. Uh, would anybody raise their hand if they've come this morning to speak in public comment? Okay, I actually see none. So we'll move past the public to be heard to municipalities to be heard. How about anybody from municipalities? Okay, I see none from the municipalities. Flying right through this one. All right, at this time we will turn to the report of the executive director, Ms. Pygott. Good morning. Today um, I'm going to share with you our August bed tax collection, which um, I think a, a bit of a surprise to me at least was up 8.6%, came in just under $2 million. I think we benefited significantly there from um, school starting later and a few extended weekends, and I'm sure a couple of people around the table will share what's going on in their properties, but I think uh, definitely the late start to school is benefiting uh, the month of August. And uh, with that, uh, increase in August, our bed tax collections year to date is at 36.3 million, down 11.5 percent. And um, this is certainly a much better spot than I think we thought we were going to be in at this point. I think there was a, a great anticipation we'd be of collections remaining, um, but uh, we are doing much better than anticipated, so that is very good news. Um, I will remind you that we were up 20% at our February meeting, so that's helping that number a lot. <laughs> um, in fact, six of the 11 months of, of this fiscal year were increases to the bed tax with that August increase, so we are benefiting because we were, we were up in those other months, but um, very pleased with where we are right now. In terms of the STAR uh, report for August, Occupancy uh, down 22.1%, ADR up 6.3%, and the REVPAR down 173 Passengers at the airport, 231,000 in the month of August. That's a decrease of 51.6%. And year-to-date uh, down for uh, 42% total of just under 5.1 or just over 5. Point, excuse me 4.1 million All right At this time I'd like to ask Brian Osaski to give a marketing update
Good morning, everyone, members of council. For the record, my name is Brian Ososki. I'm the marketing director for the Visitor and Convention Bureau. Glad to see all of you here this morning and um, present you with this morning's marketing update. So today, we're going to uh, take a quick look at our phased recovery approach um, to our marketing efforts, which includes some in our crisis communication roadmap. We'll do a quick refresher of our brand recovery campaign, and then I'll do a little show and tell and show some integrated media that's in the market. Um, touch base on Island Hopper, as well as our brand new co-op advertising portal and our rollout of the new partner programs. A uh, very brief sneak peek of this fiscal year's media, and I'll round things out uh, with other marketing news. So let's get right into our phased recovery approach. Um, it's a four-phased approach, the first phase being wait. I think we've all waited long enough. Our message that we pushed out um, was stay well and stay home, and thankfully we've moved past the wait phase. Uh, when we turned our marketing back on, um, it was the ready phase. We were re-entering the conversation, providing inspiration, and slowly beginning to incorporate some calls to action in our messaging. It really started uh, in-state with our drive markets, as well as some national placements. We used uh, creative from our Know the Feeling campaign that I'm going to share with you uh, here in a minute. The uh, ready phase uh, was paid social, OTAs, and digital display. Really, what we wanted to do was get our message in front of folks that were actively trip planning. In other words, if they were searching for a Florida vacation or Southwest Florida, we wanted to make sure to serve our ads up in front of those folks. We've just moved into the set phase. Um, people are beginning to feel more confident going out in public. Our role as a brand is to encourage people to explore, and uh, we've become more action-focused in our messaging uh, over the ready phase. And finally, phase four, go. Uh, this is at some point in the future when travel confidence returns and people are moving around, pretty much um, all of us getting back to, uh, getting back to normal. So I want to spend a little time on the issues, uh, the macro and micro issues that we're monitoring. Of course, stay-at-home uh, orders, businesses reopening, and the vacation rental issue uh, have all been cleared up for some time, but we've really been paying close attention to our uh, positive case count. And you can see here that at the end of August and end of September, we did have two weeks in a row where our positive cases declined, which was really good news. It was part of the reason that we moved from the ready to the set phase. Right now, we're seeing anything between 1,000 and 2,500 positive cases uh, throughout Florida uh, every day. That's a far cry from our 15 and 16,000 positive cases that we had following the 4th of July weekend, so it's some good news. Of course, all of you know, a few weeks ago, we uh, lifted all the restrictions on our restaurants and other businesses. The message here is that Florida is open for business, and um, our tourism economy in Lee County is also open for business. Micro issues. There's a lot on this chart. I just want to draw your attention to those top two. You can see there in mid-August through September, week over week after week, uh, travel search queries were going up and booking demand was increasing. So again, this aligns with our strategy to um, push our messaging back in market and to move through our phased, uh, our phased recovery to the set phase. So looking at the crisis communication roadmap that we've been working from this entire time, you can see that the new traveler truth is we're in a new normal. Um, people are proactively seeking an escape. Our role as a brand is to encourage, travel encourage travelers to get out and explore, of course, increase consideration for the destination. We are in a full funnel uh, approach right now, which takes us all the way from the top of the funnel at inspiration to the bottom of the funnel uh, to conversion, and we have reintroduced our co-op marketing programs for partners. We're still targeting our, our audiences. Um, you see the terminal audiences is a name that we give to the uh, various audience uh, niches that we have. There's a new one that we've added, and that's the resilient traveler, because of course we want to get our messaging out to people who are actively ready to travel. We want them to be excited and make their initial travel plans. So uh, 
In addition to the studies that we've been doing with our friends at DSG, uh, we have another visitor sentiment study that will be uh, coming soon. This is hot off the presses. This is um, research provided by a company called Destination Analysts that have been on top of uh, the COVID pandemic and the trends basically from the very beginning. And I just wanted to share this with you. The proportion of people who are now in a ready to travel state of mind is over 56%. You can see on that top, uh, top bar there, right here, it was down and now it's up. And then 40% um, of American travelers anticipate their next trip actually will take place before the end of this year, which is, again, some optimistic news I wanted to share with you, positive news. So where do they want to travel? Florida is sitting right at the top of the list. And the second most desired type of a vacation behind cities or metro areas is a beach destination, which is good for us. So just taking a quick refresher, a look at the Know the Feeling Recovery Campaign, was sort of built on a statement that uh, L.A. Thompson, one of our marketing managers, said. She said, there is an indomitable spirit here that is intrinsically upbeat and optimistic. And we said, yes, there is. We developed a concept around that idea because each of us is dealing with our own feelings about COVID, but we all want to be hopeful and optimistic, right? So with its natural setting and positive approach to life, the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel spirit is all about knowing and sharing this feeling. Hence, we came up with the Know the Feeling campaign. And what are these feelings we want visitors to feel? We want them to feel relaxed and grateful that they're coming to the right place at the right time. There again, the idea of being optimistic and enthusiastic, excited about what's to come, and the feeling of being connected uh, to the place that you're visiting and everything around you. In layout, you can see how that um, comes to life. Kick, kick back to let loose, out to sea for myself, offshore and in the moment, and for some digital display, taking a minute to stop time, know the feeling. We've also produced a 30 second video uh, that we've been pushing out on social media. It also will appear or is appearing with some of the integrated partnerships we have with some of the publishers we're working with that I'll share with you momentarily. And it's also a big part of our plan moving forward as we will be um, placing spots like this on connected TV. And Amanda, if you could play this for me, I appreciate it. I apologize in advance for the, for the sound on this. And regarding the color, I think you'll get better color on the monitors versus the projector. So take it away, it's 30 seconds. That feeling when you're in the moment you've waited for, thought about, talked about, dreamed about. And the minute you think it can't get any better, the minutes just keep coming. Know the feeling on the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel. So this is the part of the uh, presentation where I like to do a little show and tell and show you some of the um, placements that we have in the market. But I did want to draw your attention to this. This is our travel disclaimer. And this appears in all of our native content. Uh, it might be at the beginning of an article. It might appear at the end. Um, but we want to be sensitive to everyone's feelings because, again, everyone's all over the board. Some people are ready to travel. Other people still feel like they want to stay home. So we acknowledge that. We all have different feelings about traveling right now. When you're ready, we hope you feel safe, inspired, and excited to join us on the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel. So jumping right in, um, this is a, an article, uh, integrated package that we have with Condé Nast, one of three, not just another day at the beach. Since I'm not online, I'm not actually scrolling through, but I'll show you some screenshots. We touch on North Captiva, uh, as well as Bonita Springs, and you can see some of our digital banner ads there accompanying our content. Another article with Condé Nast Travel focuses on um, our culinary uh, story, island hopping for Florida's freshest flavors. You can see in addition again to um, pictures of the food that we have offered here in the, uh, the uh, 
the places that you can enjoy that food, we've also incorporated our digital banner campaign uh, in with that story as well. Smithsonian is also another great partner for us. Uh, this piece uh, allowed us to focus on uh, the nature opportunities that we have in Lee County, why the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel is a wildlife adventurer's dream. Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, Ding Darling, and Lover's Key, uh, all the focus of this particular piece. The New York Times always delivers strong ROI for us. This is an itinerary-based placement, how to spend three days in a coastal paradise. As we go through here, of course, we make suggestions uh, for uh, places that people should go and things to do um, if they only have three days to spend here. But I wanted to share this with you because the New York Times never lets us down. They worked with an illustrator and did all of these custom illustrations for the destination that are integrated into uh, this article. This, of course, showing the uh, roseate spoonbills, an underwater shot, and then uh, the Sanibel Lighthouse. So really fun stuff. They always deliver. And then the last example, uh, this is uh, from National Geographic, Discover the Cultural Heritage of Fort Myers and Sanibel. And this is probably uh, one of my favorite examples that I'm sharing with you today because oftentimes um, I know we, we do talk a lot about the beach and uh, the coastal experiences that you can have here, but I wanted to show sort of uh, the depth of our storytelling and this piece does it really, really well. Again, I'm not scrolling through as you would on your phone or on your laptop. I'm just showing some screenshots. But you can see it does, it does start where, well, uh, with seashells because, of course, we're the seashell capital of the world. But it takes people through paddling, mat lache and art, culinary, feasting on the fresh daily catch, fishing, vintage charms of old Florida, Ding Darling, tasting local foods rooted in farm and ranch traditions, the farm to table story that we have here. This particular uh, location is Rosie Tomorrow's. Of course, Edison and Ford winter estates. And finally, honoring African-American culture and history at the Williams Academy Black History Museum. So, of course, we do tell the beach and the coastal story, but I wanted to share this uh, with all of you to show that we are telling a lot of stories um, in these placements. Something else that's fun I wanted to share that with you that we just wrapped up a few weeks ago uh, called Beach Ready Spirit Week. This was a social media promotion that actually didn't last just one week. It spanned the course of four weeks. And basically what we wanted to do was get people into the beach frame of mind. And every week beginning on August 24th and running through uh, the third week of September, we uh, challenged, encouraged uh, people on social media to share with us their flashy beach fashion, how they're creating an at-home beach retreat, what beachside bites are they looking forward to, and how are they decorating their home with beach-inspired decor. So we got a lot of uh, participation, over 100 submissions over the course of the four weeks, which we thought was really cool. There in the top left, someone took the time to make a beach out of couscous. That's what you're seeing there. And you see uh, some flashy beach fashion, of course some food, and then some nice turtle cookies in the bottom right, uh, a frame that someone created from seashells. As part of this campaign, we also worked with some influencers to uh, give us some additional lift. This particular uh, post was from Aaron Outdoors, and I just wanted to read this first paragraph to you to show you what you're seeing here. It says, here is my recreation of a Sanibel Beach sunset. She made this with tin foil on a cutting board with sweet potatoes, a lamp, and model train figures. The birds are cardboard cutouts I made based on some of my photos from the real place. She said she visited Fort Myers and Sanibel for the first time last year, and the biggest thing that stood out to her, besides the beautiful beaches, was the fantastic bird watching. My favorite images and memories from this trip involved birds. And so she uh, had a series of posts like this that we were very, very impressed with. Overall, the campaign earned over 330,000 social, 330, 330, social engagements, which was one of our primary metrics, of course, that we measure with social media. Over 100 entries, as mentioned, and over 3.5 million impressions. Really fun campaign. Get people in the beach frame of mind. So for Island Hopper, um, 
Our Songs from the Sofa series continues every month. For those of you who don't know, of course, the, uh, the event was, was canceled due to COVID this year. Um, but we wanted to keep, keep things going, keep the momentum going. So every month we feature a songwriter from Nashville who spends 45 minutes to an hour um, uh, streaming on Instagram with Mike Tyler from iHeartMedia, one of our partners. And they tell their stories and play some of their songs uh, for the social media audience. So it's a way to keep momentum and keep people engaged with the festival. Our team has created and, and, and finished a brand new Island Hopper website. It was finished last month. And next year's dates are already locked in, September 17th to the 26th. And we are counting down. As you can see from the hero image from our website, we have a counter uh, going right there front and center. This pulled a few days ago, so probably uh, less than 347 days uh, to the 2021 edition. The same time we were developing uh, Island Hopper's website, we were also putting together a brand new co-op advertising portal for our partners. That is launching this month for all of the programs that are going on sale from January through September, quarters two through quarter four. It's a fresh new look, it's very intuitive, and it is packed with partner and admin features for efficiencies that we really, really needed. This is the login screen, and then just quickly wanted to share with you a program detail that if any of you participate with us in co-op that you'll go in and see. Um, it's very clean, it spells out the opportunity and the overview of the program, it talks about the price, the estimated impressions, how many participants um, can sign up, start dates, end dates, and uh, new for us that we're really proud of, it also shows uh, some visuals that can support the placement. In other words, bring this to life. I'm a partner, show me exactly what I'm, what I'm buying into, and we're able to show those uh, visual examples now. So we're really excited about that. The program itself, this year we handled a little differently than we have in past years. We've rolled it out in stages, in two stages, because of the uncertainty around COVID. So obviously we're in our new fiscal year right now. We have uh, partner placements in market October through December, these went on sale August 18th on the existing co-op portal. As mentioned, quarters two through four, January through September, will roll out for a partner preview on November 5th, and then we'll go on sale on the new portal that I shared with you on November 19th. So taking a look at not all of our media for next fiscal, or this fiscal now, um, just some, uh, some tidbits to let you know the direction that we're going in. Today you've seen me put a lot of green boxes around a lot of things, and when it comes to the consumer media approach, I have to put a green box around the entire thing. We're taking it seriously. Uh, we're still maintaining our seasonal approach to our marketing. Right now in Q1, we're maintaining our drive and fly strategy to the destination, and then as we move through the fiscal year, we'll continue to reassess. Our audience strategy hasn't changed all that month, much. We've, we've still targeted all of the uh, personas that we've identified. Um, the one addition to that, of course, is what I mentioned. We're adding um, uh, the resilient audience to the list to make sure that our marketing and our messaging is getting out to folks who are ready to travel now or in the near future. We have a great media mix, um, really learned a lot to how people are consuming media during COVID. Podcasts are up 20%, Instagram, Instagram usage was up 14%, connected TV up double digits, as well as smartphone usage, and all of these things have been incorporated into, into uh, this year's media plan. And of course, we'll maintain tracking all, on all of this, measure everything, and make adjustments as necessary. So three of these partners I shared with you earlier, Condé Nast, The New York Times, and Smithsonian, will continue our partnership with them throughout uh, 2021 because they're tried and true and they deliver strong ROI for us. Meredith is also on this list. We've had a lot of success with them and I'm sure that uh, 2021 will be no exception. Meredith is Travel and Leisure, Parents Magazine, Southern Living, and Midwest Living. Some exciting news, I'm sure you've probably heard, we have some new direct flights on Alaska Airlines uh, coming uh, uh, from the West Coast, from Seattle and Los Angeles, uh, just in time, I believe, correct me, 
before Thanksgiving, yeah. November 24th, 22nd, somewhere along in there. And um, the team has started the conversations with the fantastic folks at Alaska Airlines. Uh, we're getting our two agencies together and we're putting together a game plan uh, so we can do some cooperative marketing efforts in those markets to make sure those flights are full and as successful as possible. Can anybody tell me who this is? It is. <laughs> Samantha Brown, that's right. 17-year veteran from the Travel Channel. Uh, she now has her, um, her own show on PBS. And uh, we are putting together uh, an extended, integrated package with Samantha Brown. Um, she, her show is called Places We Love, and we, 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 we're sure that she's going to love the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel. Really will represent our brand well. So for other marketing news, um, the team has historically put together a social media boot camp for our partners, which is a three or four hour deep dive into all things social media, take place in this room over the last several years. This year we did something a little different. We broke it down into hour blocks, one hour blocks, and put a series of three educational opportunities together. Number three of three takes place October 15th. We're also um, going through the proposal process, the RFP process for a new visitor guide. So some news for uh, next fiscal year, this fiscal year, we will not have uh, our Lonely Planet guide moving forward. Uh, we are down to two publishers and we have final committee evaluation for who that will be coming up with procurement on October 16th. Uh, Nancy is not here today. I just wanted to give her a shout out for all the hard work that she did and um, the subcommittee as well on the attractions, events, and beach and shoreline funding programs. All of those application cycles are complete. And finally, in place of uh, an annual meeting that, um, that we have done over the last, I can't tell you how many years, uh, as a live event, this year, we will be doing a, presenting a virtual tourism outlook in place of our annual meeting coming up in just a few weeks on October 29th. Uh, it's where we will roll out our new sales and marketing plan and also talk a little bit more about our bright and shiny media opportunities. We've got some fantastic speakers to talk uh, about the trends and what we can all expect moving forward. And unless anyone has any questions, that is my marketing report this morning. I have a question on yes. what time is that going to be on the 29th, do you know? Yes, it's uh, right now scheduled at 10 a.m. And um, we're still trying to fine tune the show flow, as, you call, as we call it. It may be uh, an hour and 15 minutes, but we're going to do our best to keep it to an hour. So somewhere between an hour and hour and 15. Ten, 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Colleen. Can you talk a little bit about people looking to travel and, and do you think that that they're doing more just coming to see family or you think they're looking to travel on their own like people haven't seen that some people haven't seen their family in months I mean I think that's a I think that's a really good point I think there are a lot of motivators uh, it sort of goes along with the idea we've all been talking about about pent-up demand and um, uh, as I said, all those indicators that we're, that we're taking a look at, that we're watching, are showing that people are becoming more comfortable, they're starting to, to, to move around, certainly searching for travel opportunities, um, but we love to host them as well if they're coming to visit friends and relatives as well, for sure. I think um, some of the DSG research, Tam, would, would be able to answer that question more specifically than anything that I shared with you this morning. A little bit, but I think, you know, it is a combination, uh, just like your normal travel plans. You know, sometimes you're taking trips to visit with friends and relatives, and sometimes you're taking trips for leisure travel or business travel. Um, I think that, um, you know, we haven't seen any indicator that people are going to do family visits instead of leisure travel. Um, but uh, I think, you know, it's all on the table, right, you know. And sometimes they're combining them. I know families are sometimes meeting in the middle. I've done it myself. So, you know, um, get together with family, but do it as part of a leisure holiday. So. 
Brian, I, I, we're seeing 60 to 70 percent decline in the OTA, OTA business, Expedia, Booking.com. Have we shifted any uh, aware, brand awareness away from them with the, the significant decline? Well, those are lower, lower funnel tactics. I mean, we feel like if people are on an OTA, they're actively trip planning. I think what we're finding is that people are going to the OTAs because they're one-stop shops. I think they're finding their, inform uh, their information and inspiration, but ultimately not booking on the platform. I think just because of flexibility and cancellation policies and wanting to know, you know what each particular property's uh, safety protocols are and that sort of thing, I think have, uh, have taken away from the booking on those OTAs, but not the searching. It's a delicate balance for us, as you know. Yeah, and you too. I want to keep the awareness on it. I would agree they're they're shopping there, but they're not. Yeah. Nobody's there's significant declines in booking there. Correct. Which is great for the hoteliers. But you say you know, you're going to save that you're going to save that percentage um, that 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 fee or commission, um, but again, we feel like as travel and tenders, uh, that's where we need to be, and um, our our comp set is there as well. So we, we, you know, we want to remain competitive amongst the comp set. Anything else? Any other questions? Thank you very all much. Right. Thank you all very much. Your report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Sam. What a great report. Uh, very good to see some encouraging August numbers and hopefully we'll finish the year um, with even more encouraging news. All right. So the next item is uh, under new business. Uh, We've been um, brought a letter uh, to, for, for your consideration this morning, uh, considering Kay Acosta and a dark sky designation. Uh, the real meat of the letter uh, gets in to the second paragraph where it says the TDC would strongly support and endorse Kay Acosta's application for the dark sky designation. The pristine beauty of Kay Acosta and 2,400 acres of preserved space fronted by nine spectacular miles of beach rich in shelling, fishing, walking, and biking, and camping, uh, you know, makes it the perfect place for a nighttime sky viewing for both visitors and residents of Southwest Florida. So basically, the, the goal is to make sure that no street lights are ever put up <laughs> out there or lighting out there that would, uh, that would impair your ability to view the nighttime stars. To me, it seemed like it was a pretty easy ask because uh, I, I don't foresee any of that ever really being built out on Kay Acosta ever. But I wanted to open it up for your discussion. Does anybody have a problem or concerns with us endorsing uh, a dark sky designation on Kay Acosta? Uh, Rob, yeah, go ahead. I don't have any problem with it. I just wonder what, what led to this on an island that has almost no residences is primarily all a big state park. Is there anybody from Kay Acosta that wants to speak to it? Glenn, do you have any thoughts or comments on where, where this came from and what led, the, led to this? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm afraid I really don't know. Yeah. Sam, do you know where it came from? So this is a request from the, the uh, Friends of the Kay Acosta State Park, and it's a designation that will give them, uh, they, they, they get to put that dark sky designation uh, on their materials and promote it. I think for us, it's a tourism tool. Um, you know, people want to travel to dark sky destinations so they can stargaze. And um, I, I really don't think it was uh, intended about pu not putting any additional lighting there. It was more just achieving this designation as a promotional tool. Um, you know, obviously, Kay Acosta is, is uh, you know, almost completely free of any, um, uh, you know, man-made light. It's a natural lighting situation and just a really great place to stargaze. So that's what it's about, sir. Yeah, Mr. Wells, you going to follow up? No, I didn't have a discussion. Uh, I, I would agree with all that. I just, there's, there's single-family residences on Kay Acosta, and I don't want to get in the middle of an issue that might be going on that we're not aware of. I have no idea that we are um, between somebody's private personal residence on Kay Acosta and whatever this is about. Um, so I'd feel a little more comfortable. I'm, I'm all for it. I'd feel probably a little more comfortable voting on it if somebody who was a representative was here to explain it a little further um, because I just, I just don't think we've gotten a lot of info on it. Are they up against a deadline to get this turned in? Um, for this meeting, I'm not sure if we set 
exact deadline, but I can. We can follow up with you on that. Um, was this just this just for the state park, or was this for the entire island? I believe it is just for the state park. If it's just for the state park, I mean I, that's a, that's a, that's an easy easy go, I think. But listening to Rob and and you know, I was an individual owner, and somebody was pushing something through, and I didn't know about it. That would be one thing. But if it's just for the state park alone, I mean I'm okay with that. You can certainly clarify that in, in the letter. In the letter, okay. And, and uh, that way it gives them what they want. It, like you say, the designation of that. I think that would work for them. Okay. So, uh, so I think if I'm hearing correctly, just to kind of recap it, like a motion for approval of the letter uh, as amended to state that we are intending this for the state park uh, portion of Kea Costa. Correct. Okay. Would you like to make that motion, Mr. Lappy? I'll make the motion. Okay. So we have a motion from Mr. Lappy. Do we have a second? Second from Colleen, Ms. D. Pasquale. Uh, do we have any further discussion on the item? Uh, yeah, Mr. Wells. I would support that motion. And if you look at this letter, it doesn't, it doesn't differentiate between the state park and the island of Kea Costa. So I would be for it if it's specifically for the state park yeah. or if the state. other residents of the island all, you know, made a case. the motion for. just for the state park. Okay, so amend just to specifically speak to the state park. Yeah. Okay. Very good. What other questions or concerns or comments? Okay, seeing none, then um, I'll go ahead uh, and ask did, did anybody want to speak in public comment on this item? Okay, I see none, so we'll close public comment. Uh, I'll call the question then are there any objections to the motion? Okay, seeing none, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, folks. All right, Tim, is there any for council information? There are, a couple. there are a couple items in your packet. I'd encourage you to take a look at them. Um, some, some research, recent research data. Um, one, one in particular from U.S. Travel just came out this week about, uh, you know, anticipated employment levels going forward and the need for um, a, additional uh, stimulus uh, relative to the tourism industry, particularly, of course, the airline industry. And I hope you'll take a look at that. Um, the, Definitely a bit of a grim outlook for, for the remainder of the year in terms of tourism employment. May not necessarily be the case here, fingers crossed, but um, a, a bit of a grim outlook. So wanted you to have that information. All right. Well, I uh, kind of hate to end on a downer. But. No, no. Well, <laughs> real, sorry. It's, no. It's realistic. It, it got to be straight up, right? There's certainly a lot, a lot of things to consider right now. Do any of the members have any member items they'd like to share today? How about Ms. Cronin? I have a shameless one. <laughs> All right, let's do it. We are, like everyone else, being very careful and moving forward with some opening. And we do have one event that we are opening this Sunday for a first time, and it's our NAM Jam, which is the um, uh, honorary event for Vietnam vets. And so we're taking it very carefully. We're doing it a little smaller than normally. And of course, social distancing. But we are very excited to be able to be careful to do that. And um, with the Military Museum in Cape Coral and soon to be somewhere else, um, uh, we're very excited about that. So we are doing that this Sunday. And um, just looking forward to reopening our world very carefully, very slowly. Gotcha. Good. Well, we're glad to hear about that. That's exciting news, and I hope it goes off really well. So, what other announcements? Any any other member items? Yes, uh, Brian. Uh, just real quick, uh, on the guest card for the month of August. Uh, oh, hit your green button there. Yeah. Sorry. Uh -huh. uh, Rev Car for the month of August was down 17 percent. Occupancy was down 22 percent, but bed tax collections were up 8 percent. What do you think is behind driving that? Vacation, Vacation rentals. rentals. So, Stands down. yeah. Strong market. Yeah. Very strong. That's what I would have guessed. Um, and you see ADRs up, so not only the ADRs for the hotels, but it's also up for the vacation rentals, and that's what I think is driving prices as of right not, not completely, but unfortunately. Right, which is still, still, when you look at the rev par numbers, that's the challenge the, the local hoteliers are all facing. I know the beach properties are faring a little better than inland properties are for sure. Um, my property specific, uh, you know, over the last month we've had to 
permanently eliminate, unfortunately, 106 jobs out of the resort um, because of business being down. So it's a little misleading when you see bed tax collections is up. That's really not equating to keeping the jobs and keeping the people employed. And I think it's just important to remember that as we move forward. Um, Colleen, just a comment on what you had mentioned earlier about people coming and visiting families. What I'm seeing, at least at my resort, only speaking for my resort, is it's more all families are coming together um, and hanging out. We're seeing a lot of families that are doing full family vacations with three, four, five people all coming at the same time and spending time uh, to get away. And Bill, with, with the OTAs from my property specific, what we're seeing is OTA business is significantly down, but brand business is way up, which in the long run is better for all of us and what we all want anyway. But that's just anecdotally what we're seeing in our hotel. Um, just passing around real quick, if I could, um, the Florida Restaurant Lodging Association on Wednesday, October 14th at 5 p.m. will be hosting a get-together, uh, and our guest speaker will be uh, from the House of Representatives, Spencer Roach. We'll be coming and talking about a number of different uh, items that are going to be on the ballot uh, coming up, and it's at the beautiful Hyatt Regency Coconut Point Resort and Spa. So if anybody would like to come, Please, uh, Lois is in the room here. You can see her, or you can go to the FRLA website, and you can get your uh, tickets to come to this exciting event, uh, which will be sure to be safe and fun. That's all I have. Lazy River included. <laughs> It'll be good to be back out there again, too. Uh, we, we, you know, during a normal year, we'd be there, man, more, multiple times a month. So, uh, good. All right. Any other uh, member items? Yeah, just, uh, just uh, again, what... We'll, to back up on Brian said, you know, we're seeing, I mean, the, the summer, you know, for the beach properties that we run are, are doing very well. I mean, the summer is great. It's drive market. It's Miami. It's all the families coming over at one time. Um, you know, what gives me heartburn and sleepless nights right now is, you know, January, February, March. What's going to happen? Are they going to get on a plane? Are they going to drive down? Or are they just not going to come? And that's the big question. And it's all, you know, our booking window used to be 60 days out. It's like 7 to 14 days out. It's very short term, and it happens last minute um, of what you're getting in business. And right now we're living off of Florida residents. You know, uh, the Florida residents aren't going to pay five to $900 a night when we get into February and March. So um, hopefully, hope for a bad winter. <laughs> yeah, and just, just to follow up on... Early and bad, miserable, wet winter. <laughs> just to follow up on that, for the hotels that are group-driven, um, which 60% of our business comes from the group market, uh, for the first quarter, I would tell you that approximately 45% of our groups have canceled. They're not coming. Um, so, uh, you know, that business is really difficult to refill. And Brian, so, are you seeing any weddings or any of that stuff holding up, or how's that going? We um, we had a ton of weddings cancel for the fourth quarter of this year, but we've recently started to replace some of them. So the sentiment seems to be changing a little bit, and people are starting to say, all right, maybe we'll consider doing this now. A month and a half ago, they didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Right. Uh, but I think... I think they're starting to come back a little bit from the social. It's interesting enough that the groups that we do have now, between now and the end of the year, are a lot more socially driven than anything else. Mm -hmm. They're not the meetings and incentives and stuff that we had before because businesses won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But the reunions, the sports teams that want to get out and travel, that type of business is really the only group business that we're seeing. And to add to that, I have three young friends I won't tell you how old I am, but I have young friends who had weddings planned for the fall. And I think they would get married, but their family is afraid to travel here. Like because of their, like getting on the plane to travel or maybe compromised health, it's their immediate family, parents and grandparents that wouldn't be able to come to the wedding. So it's interesting how that young, because, you know, I know one, and then one couple, they got married three times. They just did it everywhere they could. Uh -huh. Like, you know, celebrated, you know, they just like, we just, like, we planned it, we're, we're, we want to get married, and they moved on, but others have had to move theirs. But they did secure the next date. They didn't just say we're not getting married. Like, they have, they've already booked their, and moved their dates and around that. That's what I was going to ask you, Brian, is, I know they're, you said canceling, but are they, Rescheduling or are they canceling? Because I know we've had a lot of luck with the business. We've helped book a, a group business of rescheduling it for later in the year or the following year. 
Yeah, for, for, for us specifically, uh, they are trying to reschedule, but it's, it's rescheduling uh, for the group business, it's rescheduling two years out. Okay. Um, and part of that is they've already we didn't, committed. They've, yeah, and we, they've already committed somewhere else for next year, right. and or we didn't have the space, and so they're two years out. So when we start turning the corner into 2023, <laughs> it's going to be unbelievable. Um, for the social business, they're trying to schedule within the next six to eight months if we can find a space to put them into. And just to add a little bit, Bill, you know, the, my my one sense of hope <laughs> for for. The, the winter season is, you know, those direct flights in, announced by United, Boston, Cleveland, New York, LaGuardia, Columbus, India, Milwaukee, and Pittsburgh daily, <laughs> um, starting either in November or December. And, you know, it, it, a direct flight is going to be a lot more attractive to someone who is a little bit hesitant to travel than, than having to make a stop. So I think there's some, you know, I have your anxiety. That's what sort of wakes me up in the middle of the night as well. But I will say that, uh, you know, there are a lot of positive things that are happening too that may help uh, alleviate that. And um, I will, as I always do uh, for the annual meeting, share a little farmer's almanac forecasting. Um, Canada in particular, brutal. Um, uh, Midwest and Northeast, brutal. Um, wet, rainy, and cold, and hopefully not too much snow because snow closes airports. So we want, we want it to be miserable, but not too much snow. All right. Anything further for the good of the order? All right. Seeing nothing further before us, then we are adjourned. Thank you, folks. Have a great month. <laughs>